is heroic. Sometimes they were. Most of the time, they were far from heroic. These Herods. You don't have to read very far in the gospel story of Jesus to come across your very first Herod. You only have to get to Matthew chapter 2. If you start at the beginning of the New Testament, the Magi have come to Jerusalem seeking the king. And the Magi have come with such splendor and grandeur as they enter the city of Jerusalem, the word spreads immediately to Herod's throne that they have come to see a king. Oh, there is only one king. There's Herod. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps we tell the story of the Magi and what happened with their coming too quickly. We don't pause long enough to ponder exactly what the impact of that meant to the families in Bethlehem. Because we might tell the story quickly and move on to what we think are more exciting events in the story of the life and birth of Jesus. But, but for about 30 fathers and mothers in Bethlehem, for a town the size of Bethlehem, it would have had about 30 male babies under the age of two. Uh, the reason they selected two was because uh, a baby was already one when it was born. So the two-year-olds would be what we called one-year-olds. And so one terrible night, Herod's soldiers came, slashing and stabbing and bashing and, and destroying in their bassinets and beds and 30 tiny, precious little baby boys destroyed that night. And Jesus had gotten away. He was safely either in Egypt or already on his way. Did Herod ever find out that Jesus had escaped and gotten away? Did he think that he had done the job that night? Probably he found out. For we are told that he had a highly sophisticated uh, KGB. Thousands of people were in his employ to give him constant information about what was going on in his kingdom. Little past that he did not know. And because of his highly sophisticated secret service organization, he survived numberless attempts upon his life. Uh, he, is, he is one of the few Herods who will die an old man. And it wasn't because they hadn't tried. It was because he was very crafty and able to thwart all of those plans. He, he eventually dies a horrible death as a result of syphilis. But not because he was assassinated. But I'm suspicious that he knew that Jesus had escaped because, because those, those Bedou shepherds, the ones that had come in that night, the ones that had heard the angels sing, the word would have spread. They knew Joseph and Mary. The word would have spread that they were seen on the road to Egypt. They would not have escaped the shepherd's eye. How do we describe Herod the Great? Uh, historians describe him bright, able, quick-witted, tactful when he wanted to be highly educated in the finest schools of Rome, a lover of the arts and sports, politically astute. He was a gallant warrior. Many of us are not aware of the fact. He is a battle-seasoned warrior, all of his own. We'll talk about some of that in just a moment. All of those words fit him. It describes a wonderful man, doesn't it? But there's some other words that also describe him. Lustful, proud, suspicious, selfish, they also described him. We could add the word treacherous. 
to him. He was an Edomian by birth. Uh, Edomia, if you'll look at a map of Palestine sometime in the time of Jesus, it was a territory just south of Judah, just the next section, just south of Jerusalem. Uh, he, he tried to perpetrate a fable. He tried to get people to believe a myth that he, that he was a longtime descendant of one of the Babylonian Jews. But it, 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 there was no truth in it. He wanted the people to believe that because there was a text in Deuteronomy that said the people should not be ruled by one that was not one of them. No foreigner should rule over them. And so therefore he did his best to try and convince them that he was not a foreigner. Uh, how did Herod the Great come to be so powerful and, and to rule as such in the land? Well, it appears that his father had been the governor of Idomea, that area south of Jerusalem. Uh, when Julius Caesar conquered Rome, Herod the Great's father was politically astute enough to send a large gift of tribute to Julius Caesar on requested. Oh, lots of people sent tribute to the Caesars, but usually they did it reluctantly. They, they did it under the sword of Roman soldiers. Hmm. Herod the Great's father is politically astute. He sends a large gift of tribute without being required. It goes over well in Rome. Caesar looks to the, this far eastern edge of his empire and he says, here's a man I can trust. And he made Herod the Great's father then minister over not just Idumea, but over Judah, Samaria, Galilee, Perea. The whole area is given to him. And as soon as that happens, of course, he needs help administering this district. And he has two very able sons. His oldest son's name was Faisal. And, and, and Faisal is made the governor of Jerusalem. And his next youngest son, Herod, Herod the Great, is made governor of Galilee, where Jesus was later to grow up. Now, he's 25 years old. He is proud, strong, quick-witted, all of these things that we said about him. Galilee is a wild area. <laughs> Where Jesus grew up, it was a place filled with political rebels and, and bandits. And Herod is now the governor of the area. He captures a very popular rebel leader in Galilee, has him executed without trial. Bad move. Because strong political factions in Judea have him arrested. Have Herod the Great is brought to Jerusalem for trial for murder. Now the, the, the leading political force under Faisal happens to be the Sanhedrin Council. Now Sanhedrin now is used to having trials. They're, they're used to having people come in before them, humbled before this great august assembly. They are used to having prisoners come in dressed in black, with their hair long and unkept, in, in mourning and sorrow for their crimes and sins, hoping that the Sanhedrin Council will grant them mercy. Oh, not Herod the Great. Herod comes in before his murder trial, dressed lavishly in purple. He brings a bodyguard into the courtroom with him. And the Sanhedrin is intimidated by the man. Except for one old rabbi. One old rabbi stands up and just leads a tirade against this pompous display, this, this purple robe, these, these bodyguards. Now, I want you to remember this story. We're going to come back to this again. Because Herod the Great now leaves Judah and he goes under the protective care of the Roman governor of Damascus up in Syria. Now I want you to remember what happened at the Sanhedrin. We will come back to that later. Well, he is now safely in Syria. And while he is safely in Syria, almost as if the, 
almost by providence, almost uh, you know, the, the, the turns and the quirks of history are so strange. For if Herod had remained in Galilee, surely he would have been sa assassinated. For large, a large political faction swept into Palestine, captured Judah, captured Samaria, captured Galilee, and Faisal, Herod's older brother, who was the governor of Jerusalem, is put into prison. He is terrified by what he knows is coming to him. He knows he is not going to have a quick and easy death. And so Herod the Great's brother Faisal, while he is in prison, catch this, he commits suicide in prison by bashing his own head against the stone walls of his prison cell. That is an incredible feat. These are stories and events that leave a powerful impact upon, upon Herod and ultimately on Jesus too. Now, Herod gathers up his family for safety. He doesn't even feel safe in, in Damascus. And he takes his family and he takes them, interestingly enough, to a place called Masada. Any of you ever hear of Masada? Do you ever hear the great place down by the, down by the Dead Sea where the Romans had come and the, the people all committed suicide up in Masada? Uh, you know, almost a Jim Jones kind of story up there. Well, he takes his family, safely puts them in at Masada, and then he goes to Rome for help. He gets his help in Rome. He comes back. He lands at Caesarea along the coast. He has with him an army. Matter of fact, he has with him, catch this, 11 battalions. A colossal 11 battalions and 6,000 cavalry. Incredible. Now, I told you, he was a gallant warrior. He was. He landed at, at, there at the coast of the Mediterranean. He fought his way down through Samaria, down through Judea, on his way to Masada to rescue his family. His family is now surrounded down there by these other rebel forces that, had, that had, was the cause of his brothers committing suicide in the prison cell. He is there. His family is thirsting to death. There has been a drought. There is no water in Masada. They are just about to die of, because he is not there yet. And would you believe, again, a quirk of history and providence of faith, there is a huge rainstorm, a thunderous storm. And his family gets enough water to drink until he can arrive and rescue them. It is now the spring of 37 B.C., Okay, we're 33 years away from the birth of Jesus. He now will take his 11 battalions, his 6,000 cavalry, and he is on his way back to capture Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is something else. Jerusalem has two huge walls around it made from limestone. How do you get in? He begins to build catapults. And at night, now, boy, you know, this is, stuff, this is Hollywood stuff, I tell you. At night... The defenders of the system of the city of Jerusalem dug tunnels out under their own walls. And at night, they would slip through these tunnels and they would come out and they would attack the catapults one by one and set them on fire and then, you know, rush back through the tunnels back inside the city. Making these battalions of Roman soldiers that Herod has brought with him more and more angry. Ultimately, it took about 60 days they took the city. And they were so angry that Herod lost, Herod lost control of his soldiers. And they start ravaging the city. They start destroying Jerusalem. People were slaughtered on the streets just like they would be in A.D. 70 when the Romans came, you know, after the life of Jesus. In order to keep, now catch this, Herod wants to establish himself as a good Jew, not as an Edomian. He wants to be a Jew. He takes a handful of trusted soldiers. He rushes to the temple. He secures the temple against his own Roman legions so that Gentiles will not defile the temple. He makes sure that the daily and the morning sacrifices are not interrupted, that they continue. 
It is an amazing display of, uh, uh, of political astuteness and wisdom. Now he finally gets his men under control. Most of the Roman forces, which we've already talked about before, most of them were mercenaries that were from Europe. From, uh, most of them were mercenaries from France and Germany. He finally gets these Frenchmen and these Germans out of there. And he is now firmly in control. Now, this is incredible. You get, I got to tell you, this is so incredible. The Pharisees, of course, are sticklers for Deuteronomy, right? Deuteronomy said, no foreigner shall rule over you. The Pharisees are sticklers for this. They cannot tolerate this. But he makes a deal with them, okay? The Pharisees will not be killed. They will be allowed... They will be tolerated on the streets. They are even allowed on the streets to stand up and say that Herod the Great is the scourge of God. They were allowed to say he was a terrible man. Catch this. In exchange for, in exchange for that they would also tell the people that it was God's will that this foreigner rule over them to punish them for their sins. Quoting Jeremiah. Remember Jeremiah defending saying, be loyal to Nebuchadnezzar because of our sins. They used Jeremiah to defend Herod's ruling over them. It was an under-the-table deal. You can tell the people I'm bad, but you have to tell the people it was God's will for me to rule over you because of your sins, and if you do that, I won't kill you. This is clever stuff. These are bright boys. Now, he is a builder. He loves sports. He, he loved the sporting events in, in Rome. He, he wanted them in Jerusalem, but he couldn't have them in Jerusalem, but just north of Jerusalem. He built a huge sports amphitheater called the Hippodrome. Huge thing. They could have chariot races inside this place. Now, of course, the Jews inside were just scandalized by this because they had Greek games up there. and Oh, this was just disgusting. So, to... to to pacify them for building the Hippodrome, he will now rebuild the second temple. Remember the second temple, Zerubbabel's temple? It's not in too good a shape anymore. It's pretty bad off. Uh, for the next several decades, Herod the Great will lavish the temple. He brings in marble slabs from France. He brings in gold from Africa. The temple under Herod the Great became one of the seven wonders of the world. It was one of the most beautiful buildings ever built. It, it, it almost marveled Solomon's temple. It was so magnificent. Remember when Titus came in, in in AD 70 and looked around? He tried to stop his men from burning it because it was one of the most magnificent structures he had ever seen in his life. And believe me, this man had been around the world. Herod was a builder. He built Caesarea. Caesarea, where, where, where he came, where he landed when he came in with his 11 battalions. He builds now in Caesarea a man-made harbor. An incredible engineering feat. This is an awesome man. This is the man who dominates Palestine when Jesus is born. No wonder Jesus and, and, and Mary and, and Joseph flee and get away from his control. His personal life was a mess. He killed his wife, Miriam, the one woman he loved, the wife, he had several wives, but this wife he loved the most. He killed the two sons. He killed his own two sons who were born from her because her family was a political threat to him. Among the Jews, you know what they said? Better to be Herod's hog, H-O-G, better to be Herod's hog than to be one of his sons. And you know how they felt about hogs, okay? Leviticus 11 and all that. But better to be a hog than to be his son. Uh, have, you ever wondered, have you ever wondered why we say that Jesus was born in 4 B.C.? You know, how was Jesus born four years before Christ? <laughs> Did you ever wonder, you know, why wasn't Jesus born in the year zero or in the year one, but why four? 
years before he was supposed to be born. Well, it all has to do with Herod the Great. Herod the Great, just before he died, by the way, at his death, he tried to kill himself. He's in the last final crazy throes of syphilis. He tries to kill himself unsuccessfully. And therefore, he finally just dies from the ravages of the disease. Just before he died, there was a lunar eclipse in Jerusalem. We are now able to take computers and, and mathematically project all of the lunar eclipses. We can date it. The lunar eclipse just before his death was the 13th of March on the Julian calendar 4710, which translates out to our calendar 4 BC. We discovered that when we set up our Gregorian calendar, which we're using now, that we had made a four-year mistake. It's been easier to live with a four-year mistake than to try and change the dates. But really, this is 1996, folks. This isn't 1992. Okay? <laughs> but we discovered that because of the lunar eclipse that happened just before he died. And of course, we know that Jesus was born before he died because of the soldiers coming to Bethlehem, right? Well, oh man, I looked at my watch. I can't believe this. You know, I'm going to have to have Herod part two next week instead of, because there's so much, because we, we haven't even gotten to Herod Antipas yet. His, his son, Herod Antipas, is the guy who kills John the Baptist, okay? Uh, we, we haven't gotten to Herod Agrippa I. Herod Agrippa I is his grandson who kills James. He has James head off, cut off. He, he's the one that throws Peter into prison. And, and the angel, because he's going to kill Peter too, because it was such a popular thing. You know, he was so, the people loved it so that he had killed James. Well, he was going to kill Peter too. But of course, the Lord had angels that come and did something special about that. Uh, this is the man in Acts chapter 12 who stands up with this glorious robe on with gold. You know, he had this robe with gold woven into it. And he stands up on the balcony in the evening before the crowd. And the afternoon sun comes and strikes this golden woven coat that he is wearing and the sun just made him blaze with light and the people started saying oh, God and he liked it he liked it oh he liked it he held his arms up and yeah I'm God and the next moment his stomach turned to agonizing writhing pain and he is drugged by his aides into the room behind the balcony and he dies Whoa, what a tale to tell, huh? But I don't have time. I've run out of all this. So I tell you, can you come back next week for Herod part two? This is good stuff, folks. And, and all of this is so in, important. Now, we haven't really talked that much about Jesus tonight, have we? And I really wanted to talk about Jesus, too, in this whole process. Uh, because obviously that's the whole function of our coming and being here. But maybe this does help you a little to understand the kind of world into which Jesus was born. We think things are bad now. We read the newspapers now and we see all the political intrigue and powers and plays and assassinations. Folks, it wasn't much different then and, and now that it is then. You know, it's, this is the way life functions in these kind of circles. But somehow in the midst of all of that, God brought forth his son to live among us. And because of Herod Antipas, who could have stopped the crucifixion of Jesus and does not, our Jesus dies for us on the cross of Calvary. And so it is this Jesus that we've come to study about. It is this Jesus who we've come to worship. And I pray tonight that you will make this Jesus the Lord of your life. Herod should have made Jesus the Lord of his life. Do you realize that we, well, I, I was going to say, but uh, this wouldn't have been true. I was going to say, you know, if Herod the Great had come to Bethlehem and had accepted Jesus, he probably wouldn't have died of syphilis, but he probably was already infected by that time. But Herod Antipas, if he had accepted Jesus, his whole story would have been different. Do you know where he died? The Herod Antipas that... The, the Herod who rules over Jesus' trial that fateful Thursday night, you know where he died? I'll tell you next week. <laughs>